In my workplace, almost everyone is dead. And I don't mean that they're dead inside or zombies before they get their morning coffee. I mean literally dead. You see, I work at the Gothenburg Natural History Museum, home to over 10 million objects, both old and new. A few of them are enormous, like our baby blue whale or African elephant. Their visual impact is gigantic. But not all of our visitors come just to see these giants. Some visit for something completely different. One day at work, I was down in the reception talking to a colleague, and this man walks in and asks where he can find the paradox worm. The paradox worm in our exhibition is about one centimeter long. It lacks a brain, anus, genitals, digestive system, but it still lives and prospers. Well, not our specimen, of course, because that one has been very much dead since 1879. But you know, the live ones, they live and prosper. Anyway, I tell this man where he can find it, and he walks away. A few minutes later, he comes back. He says he found the paradox worm. He thanks me, and he leaves. And I, <laughs> I was flabbergasted. Why does anyone come to a museum only to look at a centimeter long worm-like animal? Well, the paradox worm, it's a very simply built animal, but it's actually quite difficult to classify. It's probably the first animal with a bilateral symmetry, like having the two sides of your body, just like we humans have. And this means that it very likely holds a key position in our evolutionary tree. And that's important for our understanding of early organ development and cell functions, such as stem cells, for example. So the paradox worm is important not only for biology, but also medical research. And that is why someone comes to a museum only to look at a centimeter long worm-like animal. To see the small animal with a big story. And when I was a kid, I used to love watching and learning about nature. I collected beautiful stones, I could study insects for hours, I had a pet squirrel named Kurre. Like every day could be an adventure if you just looked around you. But then I grew up and I didn't take the time to just pause and watch the world around me. It took me getting a job at the Gothenburg Natural History Museum to rediscover my love for nature, to start feeling the fascination over the little things again, just like that man did with a paradox worm. So today, I'm going to share a few more things with you that allowed me to yet again start seeing the big in the small and to learn about the stories that hide behind every object, no matter the size. So from one worm, to another. Have you heard about shipworms and what effects they have had on history? Because as we've already established, even the smallest of things can have big impacts and tell us big stories. So shipworms, they are not actually worms. They're clams, mollusks. And they bore into wood that's immersed in seawater, like piers, ships, and other wooden structures. They're also called the termites of the sea, so you can kind of understand how this animal works. And this little animal has been the inspiration behind both literature and innovation. So you've all heard about Moby Dick, the giant white sperm whale that was the demise of many whaling ships, right? But did you know that part of the plot was inspired by a real event? There once was a whaling ship from Nantucket. That sounded exactly like the beginning of a limerick, didn't it? Yeah, no, not gonna go there. So anyway, this whaling ship was called Essex. And it was struck and sunk by a sperm whale in 1820. But the whale, it actually had some help. 
because the ship's hull, it was already severely weakened by shipworms and their tunnels. So without shipworms, the literary masterpiece that is Moby Dick would not exist. And another thing that would not exist without shipworms is the tunnel under the Thames that was built in the early 1800s. These shipworms, they are capable of tunneling through wood without the tunnels collapsing in on them. So they burrow into the wood with their valves, like small shells that they have on one end of the body. And then they line the tunnels with calcium carbonate, building these pipe-like structures that protects them and keeps the tunnels intact. And this inspired the engineer Mark Brunel to design the first tunneling shield, which is a protective structure that is still used today to build tunnels through unstable riverbeds. So yay for mollusks, right? <laughs> and if you're anything like me, you have collected beautiful shells on the beach on long summer days. But have you ever looked at a shell and thought, Wow, this is a great historical archive. Because that's what they are. Take the freshwater pearl mussel, for example. These mussels, they can get very old, like two or three hundred years old. And they filter the water they live in and store the chemical elements in their shells. And their shells grow in rings, just like trees. So you can count the years, analyze the material, and track what's been happening in the environment around these mussels. So if you have mussels that were collected in, say, the 1800s, you can sort of read the 1600s. And when you have all that data from the past, you can also make projections for what the future might look like as well. But to get valid results from research, we need a large amount of objects from different times, these long series of collected objects. And that means to study muscles, we need hundreds of every type of muscle collected over years and years. So at the museum where I work, we have around 150,000 muscles starting to understand now how big our collection is. And this is one reason also that museums need to actively collect, but also preserve the things already collected. We have no idea what future researchers can get out of our objects today. Uh, technology advances for each year. AI is already being used in research, and it's only getting smarter. And I don't think that museum curators back in the 1800s could have even imagined how much data we can get out of their objects today with the technology that we have now. It is always a tragedy when museum collections are being destroyed or not being cared for. It is a real loss of knowledge, not just for us, but also for the future. Because museum collections, they can be relevant in so many different and surprising ways. Maybe even save human lives. Like when koalas got to play a lead role in HIV and AIDS research. That's maybe not the first thing you think about when you think of koalas, right? Because when koalas in captivity started to get sick, it was discovered that they had a retrovirus that can be compared to our HIV. Zookeepers first thought this was a new illness, but then researchers made a surprising discovery. Even long dead koalas preserved in museum collections had the virus. And koalas have had this virus for quite some time, actually. Maybe even thousands of years. So the koala retrovirus, it has a much longer history than the human equivalent. So by studying that, how it spreads and evolves into their version of AIDS, we can learn a lot about the diseases in humans as well. So all of a sudden, these 
dead koalas in the collections of both the Boeslands Museum in Uddevalla and the Gothenburg Natural History Museum got to play a big part in this medical research. So what a lot of people don't know is that almost every object you see in a museum exhibition is part of a larger scientific collection. The objects are real. They're available for and used by researchers in different fields all over the world. These objects, they harbor a lot of knowledge if we just know how to look for it. And this goes for even the smallest of things, like pollen still stuck on long dead bees. So we all know that bumblebees, they have the cutest little butts, right? But have you ever studied different bees, their bodies and legs, and seen the pollen they've collected? Some bees, they have these pollen pants. It is just so adorable, but also important. Because there are bees in museum collections that are hundreds of years old and they still have pollen on them. This pollen can, of course, be analyzed. It can show us what plants the bees have collected pollen from, from exact, for example. And since we have this long series of collected bees, we can track changes that have occurred. Maybe some plants have disappeared altogether from an area. Other plants may have been introduced and this can show us changes in both biodiversity and climate. Uh, and that can also uh, give us clues on how to work forward with nature preservation for a sustainable future. But it might not be the best collection to work on for researchers with pollen allergies, though, because 200-year-old pollen, it can still pack a punch. So I'm guessing all of you here today have been to a museum or two in your life. Hands up if you haven't. And we are going to have a talk about that later on, I promise. Museums are obviously so much more than what you see at first glance. Maybe even more than we will ever know in our lifetime. Natural history museums aren't dusty collections. They're active scientific workplaces. So I work among 10 million dead, but they still contribute to our understanding of the world. Every one of these objects can give us facts and tell us their stories. And this is why I love my job, because I get to tell these stories in so many different ways, through lectures, filming short movies, writing book articles, social media posts. Because I want everyone to get the opportunity to see what I see every day at work. All the stories that shape our past, our present, and our future. And to close my talk, there once was a ship from Nantucket, its men drinking beer by the bucket. During their stupor, shipworms made a meal, drilling themselves through the one sturdy keel. Then a giant sperm whale came and struck it. Yeah.